Guten Erev Yom Tov, everyone. Gemar Chsimatova. May it be a happy and healthy and sweet new year for all of us. <clears throat> we approach Yom Kippur at a time of great uncertainty, even more so than usual. We always say that the days of awe from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur are days where everything hangs in the balance, where the final seal of judgment is suspended until Ne'ila, the close of Yom Kippur. We often say that this tension captures what Judaism is, being a thinking, believing, observant Jew in today's world, or any world, means being able to live with tension and embrace what seems to be contradiction in our world. We think that we understand how things will unfold, and yet life never ceases to surprise us. At this moment, as we stand before Kol Nidre, there seems to be an awful lot more uncertainty than usual. There's a lot less that we have to anchor ourselves with in reality, even as we strive for things that are spiritually higher. The great age of Corona. It's been more than half a year since our lives were normal, since we didn't have to worry about masks and distancing and hand washing. Back in those days, you could walk into any drugstore or grocery store and find hand sanitizer well stocked on the shelves for a normal price. If you needed for some reason an N95 mask, maybe you were varnishing wood or working with some kind of dust in the garage, you could go to Home Depot and pick up a three pack for a couple of bucks and the two that you weren't using would sit in, a, in the package in the cabinet for the next couple of years. Those were the days. We had Kiddush and Shul, we played golf and ate barbecued kishka, we invited each other over for meals, we took vacations, we got on the plane to Florida or to Israel, never gave it a second thought. Politics seemed more stable, society seemed more stable. We figured we could handle whatever came our way. Now we could be forgiven for thinking in our worst moments that nothing is stable, nothing is secure, nothing is a done deal. It's hard to know what we can count on in our world, if anything. For these seven months now, we've been more or less hunkered down, sheltering in place, driving ourselves batty with Zoom all day long. I really don't know what to say. I don't know where to begin or where to end. I've been saying for weeks now, or maybe months, it's hard to keep track of time, I've been sharing my hope and my faith and trust that a year from now, everything will be just the way we like it, the way we expect it. We just have to get there. So I thought maybe rather than talk about this year, which often seems overwhelming at times, let me talk about next year. I found it much easier to organize my thoughts for Yom Kippur for a year from now, rather than right now. So let me share that talk with you that I've prepared a year ahead of time. Here with my Kol Nidre talk, Yom Kippur 5782, Wednesday night, September 15th, 2021. Welcome everyone, good Yom Tif, Gemar Chsimatova, it's tremendous to see everyone back in shul. I apologize at the outset that we had to use the small banquet chairs in the main sanctuary this year, but we had such an overwhelming demand for tickets and membership renewals this year, and that was before the wave of new members. We had to use the smaller chairs to make sure we could fit everyone into shul. How wonderful it is to have all of us together with our wonderful choir who've been rehearsing all summer, and of course, our beloved Chazanim. It's hard to believe that just one short year ago, we were in the grip of COVID-19 with masks, with hand sanitizer every time you turned around, and with social distancing, that we had to actually limit the number of people we could accommodate in shul to, remember everyone, to, to uh, make sure that everyone stayed six feet apart. Remember those days? It seems long ago, but if you recall, it was just before we discovered how the virus was actually spreading and before the vaccine was developed and tested and available. Now, thank God, it seems to be one for the history books. In fact, Canada has not seen a single new case of COVID for many, many months. Remember way back in the early spring of 2020, more than a year and a half ago, when the first news of the pandemic began to reach our shores, our shul was one of the last to have a regular Shabbos with Kiddush before the lockdown, and 
pretty soon all of Ontario went on a strict quarantine. If you remember those days, even the LCBO was closed down for a while. Talk about nerve-wracking. Remember the endless spring and summer of 2020 when we all made the Pesach Seder at home by ourselves. Remember how we had no cheesecake kiddush or Torah tours kids for Shavuos. No regular services the whole summer. And I still can't believe we made it through last year's high holidays with no choir. I will admit I got a little misty-eyed last week when we heard our choir in full voice singing Se'u Sha'arim as we put the Torahs back on Rosh Hashanah. It was indeed as good or better as it had ever been. Hard to believe we went so long without it. It was rough going there for a while, but thankfully between the provincial and the federal governments, the virus was contained in Canada within a number of months, like most countries around the world. Unfortunately, in our neighbor to the south, acting on who knows what plan, the government bobbled their response to the health crisis to the cost of many, many lives, unfortunately, very sad to say. In fact, many pundits say that it was that mishandling of the pandemic alone that led to a change in leadership there. Anyway, let's not get too political. We're not here for that. Suffice it to say that once the new administration took over this January, the virus was brought under control much more quickly and easily than anyone would have expected. <clears throat> what does that mean for us? Well, among the most important things is that the Jays have been able to play at home again this summer. And if their performance in August is any indicator for the postseason, it'll be a great moment in Toronto's history to have a team in the World Series again and in the very same year that the Leafs won their first Stanley Cup in my lifetime. But we're not here for a sports roundup any more than we're here to talk politics. Let's talk about ourselves and our Kahila. There were so many things that we didn't have last year. Let's talk about the things that we did have, that gave us strength, that kept us going, that brought us where we are today. How did our Kahila make it when we saw so many synagogues in trouble that year? First of all, we stayed connected. Our board of directors, led by our dedicated and energetic president, Jeremy Murray, kept in touch with the entire membership, calling people to check up and make sure everyone was okay and everyone was remembered and thought of. We definitely owe our thanks to the volunteers who serve on the board to keep our shul running smoothly and efficiently, especially those on the programming committee who found the strength to come up with a whole new menu of programs to engage our new members, our veteran members, with interesting, stimulating get-togethers, first on Zoom, back in the days when we still had to do everything on Zoom, and then once it was safe to get together again in Shul, in the park, at the symphony, the theaters, the museums, and everywhere else that we saw each other these months of reconnecting and rejuvenating, restarting. Thanks to everyone who organized. Thanks to everyone who participated. Our delightful and successful KST 40th anniversary uh, event was not only a great fundraiser as an event, but it also got us connected with all those who helped and supported and built our shul over time. As a Kahila, we should extend our thanks and a word of appreciation, a lot of words of appreciation, to the 97% of our people who kept their shul memberships active during the pandemic and the quarantine, and a double thanks to those who uh, last year sponsored and filled up the foursomes for our very successful golf, golf tournament that year and this year. I don't know if you remember, but last year we actually had to postpone the golf tournament. We moved it to the week before Rosh Hashanah. But even then, it proved to be a rallying point, and most people turned around. They sponsored the golf tournament. They turned around next week and pledged to the Yom Kippur appeal, which kept our programming intact, our budgets in the clear, our shul running, and ensured that when the province gave the all clear this year, just before Purim, we were able to return to our beautiful shul in tip-top shape, back to davening together, back to learning together, and that fabulous makeup barbecue that we had uh, this past spring for Lagba Omer. So also a word of thanks to our ever-reliable barbecue team who put together the most amazing Arab Rosh Hashanah barbecue last week uh, when the afternoon of Labor Day ran right into Rosh Hashanah. I never had honey-glazed barbecued apples before, so it was a real shachianu for me, worth waiting for. It was most satisfying, I think, uh, I could say on behalf of everyone, to see pretty much the whole kahila coming together for good food, good friendship, and much-anticipated and much-needed fun 
and enjoyment of being together. As we stand together tonight at the pinnacle of the high holy days for 5,782, which sets the tone for the entire year, we pray for only good things in the coming year. We should note, by the way, this year is a Shemitah year in Israel, so many farmers are letting their land lie fallow in accordance with the Torah's mitzvah to do so, and we ought to support them. They're certainly worthy of our uh, encouragement, support, and uh, financial assistance. We also know that this year is a leap year, so we'll have an extra month of opportunities for good things. Now that we're all together again, as we had hoped for and looked forward to, it's worthwhile to allow ourselves to reflect on the alone time. How was it to spend so much time with yourself? Some got comfortable. Others were a little bit ill at ease with spending that much time with themselves. Whether you were blessed with a roommate or even several roommates, whether you were blessed with solitude over last year's quarantine or not, I think it's safe to say that uh, most or all of us spent a lot more time with our own thoughts than maybe we'd planned to or maybe we're accustomed to. So as we take a glance backward and appreciate God's kindness in helping us navigate a very challenging period in history, we should also see what insights we can glean. Maybe we'll learn a lesson or two from what we've all gone through together. As we've discussed many times, teshuva is uh, usually often inaccurately translated as repentance. More precisely, tshuva is about return. Rambam, Maimonides, writes that someone's teshuva is complete if they find themselves returning to the same situation that caused them to stumble or whatever it is, and now they're able to handle it more appropriately. That's actually a good thought for this season of teshuva, of repentance. If we had to do all that over again, God forbid, what would we do differently, if anything? How would we manage that opportunity to best advantage if we had to go through it again? And I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Are there things we would change about ourselves, about our own self-discipline, the conversations we have in our own heads, or the conversations we had about others, with others, about ourselves? And if the answer to any of this is yes, then what are we waiting for? Do we need another one of those to remind us to make positive change right now? To put those, context, those questions in context, let's review just a few accomplishments of our precious kehila in this past year of recovery and renewal. First of all, yashar koyach to those who participated in the shiurim. Uh, this year we merited to finish not one but two tractates of the Talmud. Our group that was learning shkalim went on a little hiatus during the COVID summer, but we recovered nicely and we finished out the tractate. We made our siyam and we reflected on how much we'd learned about responsibility and stewardship for public funds, tzedakah funds, among many other topics. Our essential Talmud group, learning tractate Brachos, finished last fall after a long and intensive program of study of that tractate that analyzed and provided background for all the prayers we save and the prayers we say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we say them, how we say them, what kind of frame of mind we should be in to pray. Now we've started tractate Shabbat, with very interesting and pertinent material questions covered there. We also completed our study of the book of Psalms. We went through all 150 chapters of Psalms, line by line, word by word, in Hebrew and English. And we looked for meanings in the wonderfully profound uh, poetic language there. We found worlds upon worlds, infinite worlds of meaning and reference and resonance there. Uh, it was really something, uh, really something special. They said on one of the conference calls for Jewish community professionals last year that the people who did the best or seemed to do the best during the COVID times were those who had fixed times for Torah study. Kivius itim la Torah, it's called, and stuck with their programs no matter what. I think for many of us, those set times for learning were not just inspiring, but truly sustaining. To those who showed up for the class, on Zoom, in person, I say thank you. I believe I benefited most of all. And to those who didn't, we extend a warm invitation to join us for the next round of learning and those to come in the future. It's a great sense of accomplishment to those who have completed a tractate of the Talmud and just as much so, if not more, to begin a new tractate straight away after you finish the, the one year learning. 
Remember we had that second downturn right around the high holidays last year, back to quarantine, lockdown. How did we respond? We added a few Zoom, new Zoom classes that we hadn't thought of before, that were interesting and challenging, maybe even gave us some insight. We really made each day count, and it gave us things to think about and to grow with. As we say pretty much every year, although I'm not sure we mentioned it last year, a word of thanks and a big yasha koyach to our minionaires who keep the community strong with their commitment to daily morning prayers, our gabayim, all those who uh, support and help uh, the daily minion. Davening is just is really a key part of the life of a Jew. And I think the most ever number of people this year signed up to learn how to lead services. The result is that now we have, a, we have a, now a steady supply of confident and pleasant to listen to Balei Tvila to lead our prayers. We have a nice rotation in the course of the week. If you haven't heard it, heard it come try us out. Once we came back to Shul, we came back in full force, and our minion has been going strong since reopening, and that is the backbone of a functioning community. So thanks, everybody, for your support and participation in that. Maybe the, one of the most important things that happened in this past year is the major expansion of our kids and teens programs. Once we figured out that we had dozens of kids who were waiting for good opportunities to do Jewish stuff with their peers, and thanks to the support of a few sponsors with a lot of foresight, our kids' program is now something that encourages the younger set to bring their parents and even grandparents back to shul. The force behind this is, as it's always been, commitment by each and every one of us to the idea of community, which has been fueling this Kahila's life for 40 years now. Each year we have two or three people who say that they want a discount on their membership because it's not really worth it for them. They only use it uh, one or two or three days a year, so they say. But that stands in real contrast to the 200 plus individuals and families who do renew and renew themselves in the process. Because there's a difference between a customer and a stakeholder. A customer, you have to provide them with the product and you have to give them a bargain or else they'll go somewhere else and they'll get it for cheaper. A wise man who was president of our show once told me that quality is the cheapest way to do anything. My sense, having only been here for the most recent chapters of the life of Kehila Chari Torah, is that it's always been a gathering place in the main for stakeholders. Everyone realizes we're in this together. And the more you put in, the more you get out of it, and that no one can do it alone. I think the rest of the world has been confronting this question in the recent era of the pandemic, but the Jewish people have always known it. And this wonderful Kehila has known it for 40 years now. As we begin another decade of growth and joy and community, we are all in this together. And we need one another, and no one can do it alone. So tonight, as we stand together in our familiar and comfortable shul with our dear friends and family, between Kol Nidre and the Mayrev service, with all its beautiful and stirring melodies, let's reflect for just a moment on the Shehechianu Bracha that we said just a few minutes ago. Shehechianu, we say in the words of Shulchan Aruch HaRav, uh, it says there, on all the rejoicing of one's heart that comes to us from the goodness of the world. That's when you say Shehechianu. So we say Shehechianu, when we buy a house, or even if you buy new clothes, or if someone gives us a present. Actually, there are two opinions about uh, a gift, because a gift is good for the receiver and good for the giver, so perhaps a different bracha, hatov v'hametiv, God who is good and does good, uh, would be more appropriate when people share in good things. Uh, Yerushalmi says that. Uh, customarily, it seems that shechianu is the correct bracha here, uh, say, or alacha, mishnabrura, others, now maybe in KST we should say Atova Metiv, because we all give one another the gifts of our friendship and our companionship, and as the halacha says, it's of both benefit to the one who gives and to the one who receives. Fact is, we also say Shechianu when we see, the, we see with our own eyes the good that God has brought into the world and allowed us uh, to enjoy. It's written in our Sidurim and our Machzorim that we'll say Shechianu on Yom Tov, there's a joy that we feel in the depths of our souls to be alive and to be able to celebrate another Yom Tov, another holiday, another link in the chain of the Jewish people's history that stretches all the way back to the beginnings.
and all the way forward to redemption. We are happy to be here, happy to be together, and grateful for this moment of solemn joy and health and life. Gemar Tov.